Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last episode we created data structures and functions that manage directional lighting data. In order to use the lighting data for rendering, we need to create resource buffers, and copy the data to those buffers so that it can be accessed by the GPU. In this episode, we're going to finish the light module and use it for forward rendering. We'll start by creating GPU buffers that will contain our light data. Before we write new code, I'd like to fix a couple of typos and also address a few issues that were reported on Primal Engine's GitHub page. First, I need to change this light set key, so that it's different from the other key. Looking at the internal setter and getter functions for lighting, we can see that they're constexpr functions. However, we didn't mark the camera functions as constexpr, so let's make these constexpr as well. The ones that use DirectX math library functions can't be constexpr, so we leave them as is. We can even make the D3D12 camera member functions constexpr. We also need to update their declaration in the header file. Next, I'll add some assertions to the low-level API functions where we access a light set by looking it up in the unordered map. To prevent accidental creation of light sets when a wrong key is passed by mistake, we can make sure that a light set with that key already exists before accessing the map. We can do so by counting the number of light sets with the provided key and if none exists, we trigger the assertion. Remember that only one set is associated with a key. So the count function will return either 1 or 0. The next typo is here where I spelled the function name wrong. Obviously it should be get cache pointer. We can do a tiny improvement here, where we add shader groups. We can get the size of the shader block directly by calling this member function. I'd also like to add a comment here as to why I had to create this class, so people wouldn't question my mental abilities more than usual. Let's do the GitHub issues next. I'll address the oldest first. This one's about an unused variable where we're calculating indices for the procedurally generated plane in primitive mesh.cpp. As you can see, k is not used anywhere in the inner for loop and is always zero so we can remove it. Fixed. Thanks, ob one 43 The next issue is that we're comparing floating point values in the wrong way. 
As you know, we can't compare floating point values like this due to imprecisions when the values are calculated. The correct way of comparing is by checking if the values differ more than a small amount. We already wrote an extension method that does this and we can use it instead of a direct comparison. So, if the old value is not the same as the new value, we'll update it. Fixed. Thanks code goggles. The last issue is about D3D12 surface class where I forgot to update the code that was disabled because of conditional compilation. In that video, I replaced frame buffer count with buffer count. However, I didn't replace it everywhere, so let's fix that now. Here you can see that we left the old frame buffer count here. I'll replace it with buffer count. Let me enable STL vector so I can check if I forgot anything else. Looks like we've got all the member variables in the move constructor and move assignment operator. It's important to not forget adding those, because otherwise moving an instance of the surface class would happen incorrectly. While we're here, I'm also going to remove this format member variable, since we can directly use the default back buffer format that we defined as a constant. I'll leave a note here because this is easy to forget. Seems like I missed the format variable here. We can use the default back buffer format directly here as well. We can even remove it from the function parameters. I don't think we're going to need the flexibility of creating surfaces with different back buffer formats. Awesome, we can still run the application. It crashes at the end, because we're using STL vector, so let me disable it again. And hereby I declare this issue fixed. Thank you code goggles. We can start adding code to the lighting module. In the previous episode we created this light set class that manages the lights. Now we need another class that manages the transfer of light data to GPU buffer resources. Therefore I will add a new class that I call D3D12 light buffer. Because we're using multiple frame buffers for rendering, we need to have one D3D12 light buffer per frame. That's why we have an array of light buffers here. In this class we have a local type that holds the actual D3D12 buffers. We need multiple buffers for different types of information that we want to send to the GPU. For now we only have non-cullable light parameters to put in a buffer. Later, we'll also have one for cullable lights and another one for culling information. Here we have an instance of D3D12 buffer and the CPU address of the mapped resource. We'll need as many buffers as the number of different data types. In order to update these buffers when needed, we also have to remember which light set was used and if the current light set is different from the last one. We can do this by saving the current light set key. For this class we need a default constructor. The function that actually updates the GPU buffers with the current light data, takes a reference to the light set, the key that corresponds to that light set and the current frame index. First we calculate the buffer size that is needed to contain our light data. Next we get the current size of the buffer and check if we need to resize it, in order to have enough room to contain the data.
So if we need to grow the buffer size, we need to call a function that resizes the current buffer. Let's write this function now. It takes the type of the buffer and the required size. We also give it the frame index for debugging purposes. It's okay for the size to be zero. In that case the function simply returns. Otherwise, it releases the old buffer and creates a new one with the size that's at least as big as the size parameter. We use the default init info for constant buffers, and tell the constructor to create a buffer that is CPU accessible, so that we can map it to CPU memory. We give the created resource buffer a name, depending on the type of the buffer. Let me go ahead and add other buffer types to the enumeration. We don't have those kinds of light data, yet, but that's okay. A small change in enumeration name, and we can continue. Now we need to map the resource to CPU memory. We've done this before and it's not that complicated. We call the map function of ID3D12 resource interface which will write the address of the mapped memory to our CPU address variable. Finally we check if this address is not a null pointer. Back in the update light buffers function, we can call resize buffer with these parameters when needed. In order to write the light data to our GPU buffers, we can call a member function of the light set. In case of directional lights, we call non cullable lights function, giving it a pointer to the mapped buffer resource, as well as the buffer size. These buffers need to be released when the renderer is shutting down. So we write a release function that loops through all buffers and releases each GPU resource. In addition, we're going to need the GPU virtual address of our light buffers which we can pass to shaders via the root signature. Therefore I will add a function that just returns a GPU virtual address of non cullable lights buffer. We didn't use the light set key, because we'll only need it for cullable lights, so let's leave it for now. In order to release buffer resources properly, we need to add initialize and shutdown functions to our light module. We don't have anything to initialize, so we return true. When shutting down, we first check if all lights have been removed. For this we need to add a function to the light set class that returns true if the light set contains lights. After adding this function, we can iterate through all light sets and assert that none of them have lights. Then we call release on each of D3D12 light buffers. I think this is pretty much all we need in order to handle the GPU buffers for directional lighting. In the next video, we're going to try and light our scene using everything that we wrote in the lighting module. Before ending the video, I'd like to let you know that you can now follow me on Twitter, at PrimalNippleMan. Also, 
If you're finding my videos helpful and the kind of thing you'd like to see more of, it'd be fantastic if you could support me on Patreon. Thank you so much to all of you who've already contributed through Patreon, I appreciate it so much. As always thank you for joining me today and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub, so you don't have to type everything over from the videos. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then, take care and happy game engineering.